My name is Edwin Tam. I'm associate professor here at the Faculty of Engineering. And let's talk trash, or how one person's trash is not necessarily another's treasure. This is my son, Oliver. He's six months old. The previous talk, we had the baby animals. I'll show you an actual human baby. Uh, my, my wife and I were blessed with his birth, and uh, it was amazing. Now, when he was born, we were blessed with lots of gifts and donations from friends and family. Uh, but one thing struck me, just how much you need in the modern world to raise a child. We had gizmos we couldn't even fathom that was important to raise a child these days. Now, one of the things, though, that we bought was a mamaru. And for those of you who are past the parenting years or who have yet to become parents, mamaru is essentially an electronic cradle. You can program it so that it swings in the motion to a car seat, or it has the ocean waves, which begs the question how the designers figured out a baby would figure out that it's on the ocean when it's doing that. One day, though, I was looking at this thing, and I said, you know what? This is very interesting. There's metal, there's plastic, there's an electronics base and so forth. What am I going to do with it when the kid no longer needs it? Am I going to dispose of it? It seems like a bit of a waste. Am I going to recycle it? It doesn't belong to any sort of collection scheme that I'm aware of. If I want to give it away, somebody might not want it because, frankly, uh, a lot of people don't want secondhand baby goods. And so I asked my question, what am I going to do with this? And so the challenge I have today for you is, are we asking the right questions? I would contend that for a lot of these complex environmental issues, we've sort of packaged it into simple answers. Keith Brown earlier this morning said for magic, we have to ask questions. And so some of those questions I think we've sort of forgotten and we need to look a little bit deeper into. More stuff equals more waste. In 1970, one year after I was born, the average US citizen made 1.47 kilograms per waste per day. By 2012, that was up to almost two kilograms per person per day. If Oliver, my son, lives to age 85, which I heard in the Global Mail you probably should do for retirement planning, he's going to produce 61.7 tons worth of junk by the time he dies. That's 61,000 kilograms of crap. That is a lot of stuff. Wait a minute, you say, hey, it's not that bad. We've been taught various things. We've been taught how to compost. We've been taught how to recycle. And indeed, we have. And so what we have now is our blue box. Blue box to the rescue. When I was a youngster growing up in Edmonton, we put out two to three trash cans of waste a, a, a week, I would say. Newspapers, organics, whatever you have, you went into the trash can, and away it went. Around the mid-80s, the blue box came along, and this was a savior uh, for a lot of things. Uh, what I mean by that is it took away some of our personal responsibility in terms of how we put stuff out. We don't have to think about it. If you think about a previous generation, your grandparents, they probably had to think, are we going to actually dispose of this? Can we repurpose it? But here, like the magic, it disappears. We don't have to think about it anymore. But it's not just about the amount of waste. It's also the composition that is important these days. Here's a shot of uh, when I was in Costa Rica. So for those of you who pay tax dollars, I went to Costa Rica to do research. That was a nice time. But in fact, we were there for a serious purpose. We were there to do a waste sampling study. Now, for those of you who like coffee, I have to show this slide. It doesn't exactly relate to, to my talk. On your left-hand side, does anybody recognize that? That's a coffee plantation. And right on the right-hand side is the landfill we were working in. If those of you know anything about the environment, there was no buffer. There was no leachate collection system. So next time you like your exotic flavored coffee, you might want to think where that flavor comes from. Um, <laughs> but this is what we did. We sampled 7,000 kilograms of waste by hand, predominantly organics. And we sampled just about everything you can think of, baby diapers, kitchen scraps, dog poop, and the occasional syringe. But what's interesting here is the composition. Costa Rica at that time had about 60 to 70% organic waste, which is more than what we would have in North America, but not as much as you might have in other countries anymore. So what was happening in Costa Rica is what we sort of have happening all over the world in that the waste is changing from the organics to more of these household items like we have here in Canada. You have your papers and your water bottles. Thank you very much to Ted for supplying the best prop ever for my, for my talk here. Um, and so we have a lot more of these things in our waste. So everywhere around the world is becoming a lot like us. And I'm not sure that's necessarily a good thing. What do we know about these products in terms of our waste composition then for the blue box? Well, this is a simple consumer product. It's essentially one material, one function. It holds water, it's got plastic, I throw it away. If you think of what you put in your blue box, it's your things like your newspapers, your magazines, your shampoo containers, and so forth. But the inherent simplicity of that item lends itself to recovery. The best example is a metal can. If you put away a soup can and you run a magnet over top from the recycling line, you can pull it up quite easily. 
And so the simplicity lends itself to that. But that's not what we have these days in our consumer-oriented society. We've got this. We have what I'll call cons complex consumer products. Your computers, your projectors, your cameras, your GPS units, your smartphones. Even something like an automobile is a complex consumer product. It's this mass of metal, plastic, glass, electronics, even some hazardous stuff, all fused into a single construct that might serve multiple purposes. Even worse, we have more of these things. Every household has six laptops, four tablets, two smartphones, and a partridge in a pear tree. We are 46 days away from Christmas, everybody. Another opportunity to buy and get more stuff. The problem here is that we have assigned the same simplicity or the same merits of recycling from the simple product to the complex product. If somebody says to us, oh, don't worry about this, it's recyclable, it's almost like we said, oh, well, I've sort of taken care of my environmental responsibility, check, I'm done and off it goes. So I'll buy that expensive item and off away it goes. I don't have to think about it anymore. What, how much quantities are we dealing with? Well, in the United States in 2009, which was probably, I would say, the last best accurate data we could get, 47.4 million computers were destined for end-of-life management. That's a nice way of saying they're going to go get junked. 38% of that was collected by weight for recycling. Those of you who are students going, 38%? If I was here, I'd get an F. You know, thanks for showing up to class. That's about it. It's even worse for mobile devices. There were 141 million devices of these um, uh, available for junk, and only 8% were collected for recycling. That's a really paltry number. Notice that I said collected for recycling. I didn't actually say whether or not they got recycled. And what's even worse, if it does recycle, you're probably hoping it wasn't sent to some poor, impoverished area overseas where you had underage children working under hazard conditions to extract those metals and those materials. What's the issue here? Well, it's the end of the life, what we call end of life management. It's the end of the line. Just because something is recyclable doesn't mean it gets recycled. That's a question we have to ask. And why is that the case? Because nobody wants it anymore. If you think about it, a manufacturer makes a product because they want to make a profit from it. You, the consumer, use it because you want to get some value out of it. But when you're done, it's junk. I want to toss it away. I don't want to see it anymore. Nobody owns it anymore. It all belongs to us collectively. That's why you pay your tax dollars for the garbage man to take it away. And of course, with solid waste, it's not unlike air or water pollution. If there's a significant problem with air or water pollution, it can come and bite you right away. But with solid waste, unless it's a warehouse full of tires, it suddenly catches fire, nobody's probably going to notice for years, maybe even decades. These Issues can be probably best uh, seen in, say, a vehicle, an automobile. That's a great example. And that's what we have, we call life cycle assessment. You've probably heard about it. This is what we mean is we look at the burden, the environmental burden from the start to the finish of a product. Now, for vehicles, you can probably notice there's a lot these days about hybrid electric vehicles, electric vehicles, alternative fuels, and so forth. And that's great. Of course, when we build the car, there's a lot of environmental impacts. When we dispose of the car, there are environmental impacts. But right now, the use phase, where you're driving around, burning emissions, that has the most impact. And so, rightly so, we should spend our time on it. But I would argue that as we get better and better at the middle phase, it's things like how we dispose of the car that's going to make the difference in whether that vehicle is truly sustainable or not. Now, there's a few, of course, a few other issues when we look at this. Well, if we're going to make the car more lightweight so that it burns less fuel, we need to do something we call material substitution. It's kind of like a diet. For me, if I eat less, I'll have fewer emissions, right? Is that how it goes? Well, we're going to substitute, say, metals with plastics. Uh, I'm on a bend to see how many times I can use that image of the water bottle in my presentation, by the way. All right? Plastics are wonderful 20th, 20th century, now 21st century modern creation. They're malleable, they have many properties, you can structure them however you want. But when you put them into a vehicle, you may put them in places that you can't access easily. Think about it, you don't want a car that you can dismantle in 10 minutes. You want that car to hold up, especially if you're in an accident. So how do we get at these things? Well, in large constructs, we use destructive forces, like a hammer mill or a shredder. Basically, we're gonna take that thing, we're just gonna smash it up. We're going to liberate or separate the materials from one another. And so you can pick at it. Well, if you had metal, you could take the metal out very easily with a magnet or something like that. But plastics have a lot of similarities to one another. It's not that easy to separate. And if you don't have the technology, and if it's not, you don't have a lot of money to do it, those tend to end up in a landfill. So now we've got a classic case of what we'll call displacement. We've basically shifted the environmental burden from the use phase down to the end phase. So what was not so much of a problem now has become a bigger problem at the end. 
And now we have to think of ways we're going to deal with it. Is it hopeless? Well, no. There's a lot of people who are doing some research into this. But sometimes it takes a little bit of what I'll call unconventional wisdom. Conventional wisdom says that if you design something, if you want to be environmentally friendly, you should use the least number of materials possible. So let's take our example, we want to put some plastics in. We need to connect two plastics, A and B, together. Well, if we want to reduce the number of materials, we're just going to glue A and B together. Maybe we'll heat weld them or something. But what happens is you tend to fuse them along that seam, and you can't really separate that. So you can think about it, okay, I've got this fused plastics in between, and I smash them up. I get bits of A, I get bits of B, and I have bits of AB stuck in the middle. What do I do with this stuff? If I'm a reprocessor, I want plastic bits that are pure, they're uncontaminated. I maybe just want A, I don't want B, or vice versa. So how do we get this, rid of this AB in the middle? Well, unconventionally, we could introduce a third material. We could use metal rivets, because what happens is during the liberation, the forces will smash them apart, the rivets will come apart, and A and B are now separate. They're not fundamentally joined to one another. It's more like the situation we had in the simple products in the blue box. And you can then even run a magnet and maybe get the rivets out. So sometimes when we want to do this, we might think a little bit unconventionally about how we approach the issue. This gives a, bare, uh, a very good example in terms of, hey, we're talking about creativity. How can you, as a designer, if you're on the technology end, design something at the beginning so that it can benefit something at the end? So rather than taking maybe the least, uh, the least uh, cost effective or the least environmentally damaging, think, look, over the overall scheme, can I do something a little bit different to benefit the actual recovery? And we sometimes call this design for environment or design for recovery. But I, it's a little bit... We have to be a little bit cognizant of what's going on in the world. I'm going to call it double jeopardy. Tablets. How many of you own a tablet? Or something like that in the audience. I see some hands come up. Well, tablets are sort of the tail end of the electronic office, right? This is the paperless office. We get away from paper. In 2012, they reported 200 million tablets were sold globally. By 2013, that had doubled to 400 million. Does that mean our use of paper has, has decreased? Not at all. Since 1980, the global use of paper has increased again by half. So now we have two problems. We have more of the simple consumer products to do with waste and more of the complex consumer products to do with waste. And the poor blue box is going nuts. Uh, this was actually delivered in the Windsor Star about a month ago. Ironic that it comes in something you might recycle later on. Today's blue boxes are packed with lightweight plastic bottles, milk cartons, juice boxes, and complicated plastic packaging, all or more difficult or and costly to recycle. So the humble blue box, which has been a bit of a savior all this time, is now also under more stress. So what are we going to do about this? Well, we can do some things in terms of the design, but we also have to change, I think, our attitudes a little bit. I was at an engineering conference uh, a few years back. Uh, the students were competing. And Thomas Homer Dixon, who is the chair in global issues at University of Waterloo, was addressing the engineering students. And he said, with reference to climate change, the age of mitigation has passed. What we mean by that is the age where I can sit back and say, you know what, I'll just drive a little bit less, and that's my contribution to the environment. That's over. He said we have to engineer and intervene in our environmental remedy. That's scary. We're going to engineer a solution. I'm in engineering. Engineering is probably what got into this problem half the time in the first place. But we have to be more proactive about these sort of things. Now, earlier, the, our lead-off speaker from Simon de Troyes said we have to make choices. We have to make commitments. So now there's three questions that I'd like to pose to you that you think about when you go out and do that, because it's all about that commitment. If you buy a product, ask yourself, first of all, is it going to be recyclable? Don't buy into necessarily the green marking that will come with it. Second, if you choose to buy that product, and sometimes you don't, are you going to take that product to make sure that it is properly disposed of and it is properly recycled? It's good to say lip service, yeah, yeah, I'll do it, and we know all we know in a rush, and you know what, we're just gonna heave it in the garbage, and off we go. And the third one is might be the hardest one to ask, do you even need it in the first place? And even though you may not have the creativity to design that product in the first place, you have the creativity to decide, do I even need it? Is there something else that I can make do with? So choices are very important. I'm going to end with a little anecdote. One of the earliest students I had when I came here at the University of Windsor, um, he was designing, he did a little bit of waste study uh, sampling here at the, on campus. He was kind of doing a pilot uh, project. And what he did is he walked into one of the classrooms, and he looked at the recycling bins, which was placed awkwardly to one side. And he said, you know what, that isn't very good. So he took the recycling bins and he took it and he put it in front of the garbage bin. So you could not miss the recycling containers. 
And so he sat back and he watched his classmates on how they, their use pattern was. And he watched one classmate take an aluminum can, walk up to the garbage bins and the recycling bins, looked at all the recycling bins, looked past the recycling bins, and still throw it in the garbage can. It's not necessarily a good choice. So you need the hope, but that comes with making better choices. So in the end, I'd like you to think, be better than the one who doesn't care. Thank you very much. <laughs>